So his name is Kappas, Franz Xaver Kappas, the quote unquote young poet. Um, the story had always been pretty much known that he was a student at the military boarding school that Rilke had previously attended. And so one of Kappas's teachers saw him with the Rilke book and said, oh, he turned into a poet, did he? And young Kappas said, oh my God, you knew Rilke and sort of put himself in touch with Rilke and wrote this letter. And that's how the correspondence started. Um, but that was all that was known because it was Kappas himself who published letters to a young poet after Rilke's death, um, but he did not publish his own letters. He only published the 10 letters from Rilke to him. It turns out actually there were 11 letters, but the 11th was pretty networky and um, Kappas decided not to, uh, not to include it. We only know about it because in the 50s, um, Kappas decided to sell the original manuscripts and then donate the money to Rilke's daughter, Ruth, or, or give the money to Rilke's daughter, Ruth. So there's an auction catalog that mentions, oh, there's an 11th letter, and it sort of summarizes it, but doesn't really quote it. Um, but that's how we know about it. And some collector bought it in 1953, and it's never been heard or seen since. So nobody knows where they are, who owns it. No scholars have ever read it. Um, and everyone thought that the Kappas letters were just gone, but it turns out they weren't. And this German scholar just got a hold of them and published them. Um, and so this is now the first time they're in, in English. Um, Kappas's uh, biography, insofar as it's known, I include in an afterword in the book, so I'm not going to go into it in huge detail. But um, basically, he um, did continue to be a writer, did not become an Olympian, high culture, Rilkean writer. He did a lot of sort of fluffy newspaper things. He was born in Temesvar which is now in Romania and at the time was way farther east uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire than Prague, where Rilke was from. So in Weimar, Germany, he had a newspaper column, Letters from Temesvar, and he sort of churned out these kind of feuilleton stories or essays, um, titles like Blonde or Brunette, The Stranger on the Train, the one who survived, you know, this sort of very pot boilerish stuff. Um, and started magazines here and there, became a songwriter here and there. And so that was his, um, that was his career. That was his course. Uh, and there are more details in the, in the afterward of my edition. Um, but, um, the main thing and sort of the center of what I wanted to talk about today is that it changes the Rilke text to have it now in dialogue and in context with this other text. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, was a little hard to take about the letters to a young poet originally, for, for me at least, and for some other people, um, is the sort of pontificating tone. I mean, Rilke himself was actually 27. So he wasn't exactly a wise old man himself when he was writing these letters of advice. And there was a certain aspect of like, now I'm going to talk about, you know, men and women. Now I'm going to talk about irony. Now I'm going to talk about fate. And you're just like, who is this guy? I mean, I know he's going to turn out to be Rilke. And in fact, when the Letters to a Young Poet was first published, as I said, it was after Rilke's death. So that's been part of the book all along. No one ever read these except Kappas without knowing that the author is the Olympian author of Duino Elegies and Sonnets to Orpheus because it was published so long after it was written. But there was this sort of tone of like, okay, like, why are you talking about this now? And the answer turns out to be because Kappas really asked him. And 
it becomes a very different relationship when you see these pronouncements not as just being broadcast to the winds, but instead like really answering this young guy's kind of heartbroken, like struggling with life and growing up kind of questions. Um, so um, that really changes what we can get from the, the Rilke letters. It turns out a lot of the subjects he brings up, whether it's God or sex or even solitude, kind of come from Kappas and Rilke really is responding to it. On the other hand, there are other things Kappas brings up that Rilke doesn't take up. And so you can really see, you know, the message might be the same, but you can really see his priorities and his, you know, kind of uh, hierarchy of what's more or less important when you see what he chooses to take up and what he chooses not to take up. Um, and even on a more granular level, it really changes the translation. So I wanted to give an example of that. Um, in letter two, uh, all of a sudden, Rilke starts talking about irony and he gives this pronouncement on, you know, you can't, you can't um, totally submit, submit to irony. And in all the decades that everyone's been reading this, it's always been a little bit of a, huh, wait, okay. I mean, letter one is a little more like, thank you for writing and you sent me your poems and here's what I think of your poems. But now all of a sudden there's this irony thing. Well, you know, it turns out that Kappas had said, um, an evil guest comes to visit my soul and I fear that guest as much as I fear those dark hours of questions swinging back and forth between madness and fantasy. Its name is irony. It mercilessly takes my most chaste and virtuous dreams and sweeps them from the mirror of my soul in my everyday life. It takes over and controls me, but in sacred moments, I take up my arms against it and win the battle. My art is pure. So, um, so that's what Kappas asks Rilke. And so for Rilke to answer really hits very differently. I want to read um, the earlier translations of the passage in letter two um, where Rilke answers. Um, Stephen Mitchell says, irony, don't let yourself be controlled by it, especially during uncreative moments. When you're fully creative, try to use it as one more way to take hold of life. In this case, the Norton is quite similar, but I'll read it anyway. Irony, do not let yourself be governed by it. So instead of controlled, we have governed, especially not in uncreative moments. In creative moments, try to make use of it as one more means of grasping life. Now that we have the question and the dialogue, it really lets us think, well, what, is that, what does that mean? Like, what does being governed by irony mean? It turns out that part of the reason we get this kind of vague pontificating sense is because it's translated without the context. So it, it doesn't, it just doesn't make as much sense. Like if, if you're just thinking about this outside the Rilke context, don't let yourself be controlled by irony, especially during uncreative moments. Like it's, it's actually quite hard to figure out what that's saying. And my new translation says, Irony, you mustn't let it gain the upper hand, especially when you're not writing. Because we have this context, we can turn the uncreative moments into like literally when you're not sitting down trying to write a poem, like that's what Rilke means, but we didn't know that's what Rilke meant. So you mustn't let it gain the upper hand, especially when you're not writing. In your creative moments, and now that contrast is clear. In your creative moments, try to use irony as one more way among others to grasp life. So looking back, we can see that 
the Mitchell kind of really veers into mistranslation because in his case, the contrast is when you're fully creative, try to use it. And so that sets up this kind of scale of being like non-creative, being sort of creative, being fully creative, and then being like Rilke God level creative. But like, that's not what Rilke is talking about. He's just saying, when you're writing a poem, do this. And when you're not writing a poem, do that. And that's a, that I think is a pretty clear example of how the backstory just lets the translation make more, more sense. Um, another example I wanted to bring up more in terms of tone is um, uh, the Christmas letter, letter six, which um, has a line in the beginning in the Mitchell version. I don't want you to be without a greeting from me when Christmas comes and when you in the midst of the holiday are bearing your solitude more heavily than usual. And in my version, I mustn't leave you without a word from me when it's Christmas, when your loneliness will be a heavier burden than usual in the midst of all the festivities. It's just a much clearer human situation that Rilke is addressing. And partly, it's not like Mitchell got the words wrong. It's that the words could have meant what he said, but we didn't know that Kappas had just written him oh, I'm so sad at Christmas time when I'm spending all my time with my parents who love me but don't understand me. You know, so this is how you can now really change the Rilke letters just by virtue of knowing this context we didn't know before. Um, let me just read those two again. I don't want you to be without a greeting from me when Christmas comes. And when you in the midst of the holiday are bearing your solitude more heavily than usual, I mustn't leave you without a word from me when it's Christmas, when your loneliness will be a heavier burden than usual in the midst of all the festivities. Um, one reason I especially wanted to bring that up is that it has this very key word solitude, which is central in the letters to a young poet. Um, and what makes that interesting is that the sort of directness, the kind of conversational, um, concrete situation language that I um, preferred to use now that I had this more information in my disposal kind of goes along with and reinforces my general approach as a translator. Um, so, you know, there are ways in which um, someone who approaches translation the way I do might have been more inclined than other people to sort of recognize and emphasize this concrete interpersonal sort of register of the letters. Um, something that I think is very interesting about translating from German is that in German, all the action is in the nouns. The nouns are very dynamic. They tend to be made up of verbs and prepositions, sort of linked and logged together. And the verbs tend to be very bland. There's a lot of go, stand, put, uh, with prefixes to turn it into a hundred other verbs. But when you're reading something in German, the kind of excitement and energy comes from the nouns. And in English, it doesn't. In English, it comes from verbs and adjectives. And that's why reading German translation can often feel turgid because you're putting, every, you're putting everything into the nouns in English and nouns in English are static. So for example, it's very normal and not over the top in German to say, you know, an enormous fear rose up within me. In English, what that means is I feel scared because I'm a subject, I'm a human that feels things. 
fear doesn't do anything in English. It doesn't rise or fall or grow or come or leave or whatever. In German, the fear is doing everything. And in English, you want a verb with a active subject and then an adjective. Um, another example um, that I that I like and find illuminating is um, there's a sentence uh, when Thomas Mann is writing about Felix Krull, uh, con man, and Felix Krull, the narrator says, the independence and self-sufficiency of my imagination was an additional delight. So four nouns, the and three of them are not really a person, place, or thing. Three of them are like a quality. The independence and self-sufficiency of my imagination was an additional delight. In English, what that means is using only my imagination was more enjoyable. That has one noun. Using only my imagination was more enjoyable. And in really colloquial English, what it means is just making stuff up is even better. I mean, that's how you say that in English. That would not be a good translation for Felix Krull because Felix Krull is a sort of wordy roundabout narrator. He wouldn't talk like that. So that's not right for his voice. Um, you know, he's not, he's not like a scrappy Saul Bellow kid character. He's a Thomas Mann character. So you wouldn't want to make him say, just making stuff up is even better. But that's how English works. That has like no nouns unless you count stuff, which is technically a noun, but a sort of pronoun-y, really. Um, and the, the German again is, the independence and self-sufficiency of my imagination was an additional delight. Not that it delighted me or was delightful, but it was a delight. So as a translator from German to English, um, if you don't want your translation to sound heavy in German, you have to pay attention to this and you have to turn nouns into verbs and adjectives. Um, so what about something like solitude that Rilke is talking about all the time. It's big, it grows, you love it, you examine it closely, it leaves you, it comes, it's doing all this stuff. And sometimes what he means by, you know, you plunge into a vast solitude inside you is you feel really lonely. And yet, Rilke isn't just a slave to the German language, he's using it to express what he wants to express. So at every point as a translator, you have to be asking yourself, does the sentence look like this because that's how German works? Or does the sentence look like this because Rilke is trying to do something specific? Um, I mean, the answer, he's always trying to do something specific, but you have to decide, like, if he's talking about solitude as this abstract thing moving around, does he, quote unquote, really mean it, or is he just writing in German? Um, so, you know, in some of the really kind of famous grand pronouncements in Letters to a Young Poet, like, love is two solitudes bounding each other, you know, he kind of means love is two lonely people coming together, but like that really doesn't sound very good. And that probably wouldn't be a good translation because that would sort of overwhelm Rilke's point with the way English works. And that's not what you want to do either. So uh, in my translation, um, you may have noticed in the Christmas thing I mentioned before, I talk about his loneliness, not his solitude in that case. But I talk about the two solitudes bounding each other and certainly use solitude as a noun in a lot of the examples in Rilke's book because, you know, that is what he's talking about, even if he might have been more inclined to talk about it because that's how German talks. Um,
I thought I'd give maybe one non-solitude example of the, the noun issue. Um, so uh, I'll start with Mitchell again. Think, dear sir, of the world that you carry inside you and call this thinking whatever you want to, a remembering of your own childhood or a yearning towards a future of your own. Only be attentive to what is arising within you and place that above everything you perceive around you. That's Mitchell. I'm only going to read these once this time around, but here's, here's my translation of the same passage. Think, dear sir, of the world you carry within you and call this thinking whatever you want, remembering your childhood, longing for your future. Only pay attention to what rises up within you and set it above everything you observe around you. So the two main differences to point to there are a certain bringing down of the register, for example, changing perceive around you to observe around you. Um, but then especially um, Mitchell keeps them all as nouns, a remembering of your childhood, a yearning toward a future of your own, whereas I turn it into verbs, remembering your childhood, longing for your future, not a future of yours, but your future. Um, so that, um, That's sort of another piece of the overall kind of difference that ended up making Mitchell's translation and my translation sound different. Um, maybe that's all to say about that on the translation comparison front. The other issue I wanted to, to bring up and, and um, and maybe end with, or we'll see how it goes in terms of time, is that translation um, is not totally independent of other aspects of what we could call book production, such as editing or sequencing the book. Um, you know, one thing I've, I've noticed that translation people um, often or at least sometimes forget or forget to maybe emphasize as strongly as they could is that translating something into English is producing a work in English that takes its place in the marketplace of English alongside all the other stuff in English. Um, it doesn't matter what Chinese poetry is doing. If you're publishing in English, translation of Chinese poetry, it's on the shelf next to the other poetry originally in English or translated into English and has to exist in that context. It has to somehow engage with the traditions and uh, conventions of what a poem in English is, because now it is a poem in English. It's not a poem in Chinese anymore. Uh, when I've taught translation classes, one of the sort of easiest and surprisingly most eye-opening assignments I can give people is name two comparable texts you're thinking about in English for your project. They don't even have to be the same genre. They don't have to be translated from the same language. They don't have to be translated at all. Are you thinking about a Loeb critical edition? Are you thinking about a Norton critical edition? Are you thinking about, you know, a book published by Knopf? Does it have an introduction? Does it have an afterword? Does it have footnotes? Who is it written for? Who do you imagine is going to be reviewing it? Who do you imagine is going to be reading it? You know, and, and so often translation students haven't thought about that. They're thinking about, you know, what do words mean and how do you transfer syntax and all of these sort of, um, first of all, more narrowly 
grammatical or linguistic aspects, and secondly, sort of grounded more in the original text and its context, how important an author is this, and why am I choosing to translate this person and not that person, and so on. But just having them flip the switch and realize, okay, it's up to me whether I put footnotes or not. That's a translation decision. I'm either explaining what I feel it's important to explain with footnotes or with endnotes, with stars or no stars, or I'm working into the text, whatever I'm gonna work into the text and leaving everything out because I'm envisioning this not as an object of study, but as a literary text for enjoyment or you know whatever your um, labels are for those different options. Um, and in the case of this new edition of Letters to a Young Poet, that was an especially interesting and complicated and frankly difficult set of concerns to navigate because one of the main reasons everyone loves Letters to a Young Poet is that it feels like Rilke's talking directly to me. That's why you give it to your nephew when he graduates or your you know niece when she gets uh when she performs at carnegie hall for the first time or whatever it is because it has this kind of immediacy and generations of readers have felt it and um now though he's not talking directly to me He's answering this twerp who's asking him a bunch of questions about his own life. And for all that, as I said, that really enriches our view of what Rilke is doing, it also does risk kind of blocking the automatic and very powerful and meaningful identification that you as a reader feel with what used to be the blank slate of whoever Rilke is talking to um, and is now not a blank slate anymore. Um, so in concrete practical terms, both I and, you know, the publisher want to keep selling lots of copies of this book every year. We want every, we want all the uncles out there to like give it to, as graduation presents. We want it to be still read and loved by thousands of people every year on the same lines that it had been before. And there's now this competing audience or idea of an appeal to an audience where it's like, wow, all the people who read Letters to a Young Poet 30 years ago, like now you should buy this edition at two because now you're gonna get the other side of the story and you're gonna find out so much more and it's gonna really enrich. So you don't wanna like hide that appeal, but on the other hand, you don't wanna make the book seem sort of scholarly or antiquarian so that, you know, person X browsing in the bookstore will think, oh, that this is the edition for the professors and this other one's the edition for my kid. Um, so that's actually quite difficult to figure out how to, I mean, there is a sort of inherent contradiction there that you can't like finagle your way out of. Um, but that's also sort of infusing all the other choices you're making when you're putting the book together. So one very concrete example, do you put the correspondence in chronological order or not? In the first draft of the translation, I did because, you know, Rilke says this and then Kappas answers and then Rilke responds and whatever. Um, the problem, of course, is that Kappas's letters are not as good and interesting as Rilke's. I mean, they're, they actually are good. They're um, certainly, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of joking about him a little bit, but they're very moving, they're very sincere, they're very interesting as documents and, um, they are, are, are worth reading, but they're not as worth reading as Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet, obviously, because what could be? So 
then we tried basically putting them all in an appendix um, so that the Rilke, you know, Letters to a Young Poet, the famous 10 letters we all know and love, it's sort of still there to, in, to read as a work. And if you're interested, you can sort of follow out this correspondence. Um, that, that is in fact what we ended up doing, the second of those, um, which brought with it a, a bunch of secondary sort, uh, choices to make. Like, you know, we decided to put at the bottom a sort of choose your own adventure style, like to read Capus's reply, go to page 100, um, so that you could sort of be encouraged to look back and forth without being forced to, you might say. Um, but all sorts of design decisions about like, do you put the titles in the same font for the two different kinds of letters? Do you, how do you distinguish the parts? Like, um, do you put sort of my introduction material like before both or before one or, you know, all those kinds of decisions um, I actually think of as being translation decisions, basically, certainly of being of a piece with all the translation decisions about who is this written for, who is the voice meant to be speaking to, how is it supposed to sound, how is it supposed to come across. I, I actually ended up thinking that this particular project was in some ways especially revealing of the way in which all these things that you might think of as uh, editorial decisions or even design decisions really are translation decisions. Um, it, um, it's the same process of I'm, I'm redirecting a text that was aimed at one audience towards another audience. That's what every translator is always doing. And that doesn't only involve redirecting it from a German speaking audience to an English speaking audience, but it involves these other factors as well. Um, and so that's why I called the talk Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet and the Job of the Translator, because that's what the job of the translator is. Um, why don't I stop there and maybe leave a, a little more time than we thought for Q&A, because um, I know that I sped through a bunch of these um, topics. I do want to mention one thing, which is that um, I recently gave a three lecture series kind of on this um, at the 92nd Street Y, also over Zoom, which means also recordings exist out there on the web somewhere. So um, in some ways, this is a shortened version of that, but in other ways, I did try and cover some different non-overlapping things. So it might be interesting for you to look up some of that, especially on the topic of kind of the, the M.D. Herder Norton, Stephen Mitchell, and my translation, got, getting a bit more into the comparisons, not on the sentence language level, but on the sort of framing level of how did she present the book? How did Mitchell present the book? What are the sort of strengths and limitations of those approaches? And how did I sort of see mine in dialogue with those? I didn't get into that so much here, but uh, that's covered in the third of the three talks, if you feel like looking those up. Anyway, thank you. I'm very curious to hear any questions, comments, or um, Alice, how are we going to do it? So um, Damien, thank you. That was really fascinating. And um, we are going to open the floor to questions now. Um, so you can either ask them live, um, in which case I'd ask you to use the raise hand function and, and we'll call on you or you can ask them um, in the chat box. I just wanna note um, that this is being recorded. I think you all got a notification of that. So if you don't want to have your image recorded while you're asking a question, you can turn your video off. So um, over to you. Wait, am I calling on people? Over to the, the collective, <laughs> excuse me. Oh, okay, yeah, you, you call on people. Yes, okay. I am calling on people. Yes, that is the plan. And okay. I can certainly ask a question, but I want to leave it to um, the audience to begin if they'd like to. Well, I see no hands yet, so. Okay. Well, then I will uh, 
I will start. So I, I thought this is really, really interesting how you characterize German and the work of its nouns um, and what that means for the kinds of work that you're doing as a translator. Um, now you translate in multiple languages. So um, I wonder if you could talk about what it's like to work in perhaps another language where the, you know, this syntactic structure, or the- um, Yeah. Different. You know, I kind of don't have as good a story about the other languages. Um, it, it's, on a conceptual level, it's the same issue, of course, um, that different languages sort of fundamentally work differently. And um, I think probably, you know, I know that translations from Spanish can sound flowery. And I suspect that's because in English, we have two vocabularies and the Latinate vocabulary is flowery and the Anglo-Saxon vocabulary is sort of heartfelt. So if you're using or kind of uh, tempted to use a lot of cognates in your translations from Spanish, then those words aren't flowery in Spanish, that's just the language, but you're gonna sort of steer your English in that direction of a little bit more, you know, suffixes and the felicity of the instead of glad or whatever. Um, I'm sure we can all think of, you know, classical Chinese poetry sounding foggy and like make up some story about how they don't have subjects that go with the verbs in the same way or, or whatever. Um, I guess I don't have quite as vivid a characterization of any of the other languages I do. I mean, the Norwegian, which is um, another language I do, is uh, is linguistically very Germanic. It's a Germanic language. It has a very similar but simplified grammar. Um, and then the vocabulary is a lot more um, overlapping with kind of English, Anglo-Saxon things. So what tends to go wrong in my experience in translations from Norwegian is that it ends up sounding very kind of primitive, you know, the stone sits, the water in the fjord, like there's this very kind of, um, not a, like beyond concrete, like hyper concrete, everything becomes like archetypal and monosyllabic. And, you know, so um, I think that has to do a bit with the nature of Norwegian and also the relationship historically between Norwegian and English. Um, you know, with with French, I, I sort of have a feel for it more than I have a, a real kind of snappy one liner about it. I mean, I certainly know that when I'm translating art history from French, um, it it has a different set of problems than academic stuff I read in in other languages. Um, you know, I guess I guess I'll let myself be like a little unfair. Um, there's, from the English perspective, a certain sloppiness in French, I which I think is surprising to some people because French has the reputation of being like analytical and pure and crystalline. But for example, in English, a double negative is a positive and a triple negative is a negative again and a quadruple negative is a positive. It has this like mathematical aspect to it. And in French, you just throw in as many negative things as you can. So the way you say it is, I never didn't never see nobody going nowhere. And that just sort of ratchets up the vibe of negativeness. You're not like actually flipping a polarity. You're just sort of using the language that way. Um, and so, I have more often in trying to grapple with French found that kind of sloppiness from the English point of view where, you know, so instead of saying the uh, habitat's influence on the inhabitant, you'll say the habitat's influence on the inhabitant with reference to the inhabitation for no reason except you want to just throw in another habite word 
because it sounds better. So it's like not put together logically in the same way. And in translating it, you have to be like, wait, is this actually, I mean, in translating it into English at least, or at least into the kind of English I'm trying to produce in my translations, I ask myself, does the third piece of that sentence like actually say anything? You know, if it's the habitat's influence on the person living there with respect to the fact of their living there, like that's just saying the same thing again. Like you don't need to translate that. Um, and that's a quality that I've noticed in French writing, uh, which um, I connect up to certain aspects of the language. Um, but, you know, first of all, that sounds mean. And secondly, it's a bit more vague. So when I'm trying to kind of give the conceptual issue, I think the the German noun example is a better and probably more politic one for me to use. <laughs> It's absolutely fascinating. Um, Matthias. Yeah, um, thank you very, very much for, for this talk. This was fantastic. So, so oh, I'm you. asking out of interest and maybe also because I'm hoping for an advice. I was part of a, of a small group who translated a Brecht fragment, Jay Fleischacker in Chicago, it came out with Bloomsbury. And one of the continuous problems we had was that Brecht very often deliberately makes bad rhymes or breaks the rhythm um, and and we really didn't want this to come across as a bad translation but we wanted right. to preserve this kind of quality of rhythm breaking and badness in the translation and this was a major struggle we had and I'm not sure how well we dealt with it but I'm wondering if you I mean I'm sure you've encountered this problem and, and how you how you deal with that? Is there something you can generalize? Or? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know that I've ever tried to generalize that before. I'll try a little bit on the fly right now. Um, I've certainly had that problem before, both personally and in dealing with copy editors who want to normalize everything. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. for perfectly good reasons. And then in the dialogue with them, when you want to say, well, the original isn't doing that, you know, they're like, yeah, that's what every translator says. The original is not written in English and my job's to make it written in English. So um, there's the sort of personal kind of reputation aspect of your question, which is like, I don't want to look stupid by producing this translation that looks wrong and clunky and bad, you know, and then waving my hands say, no, no, that's what the author's doing. Like, that doesn't help. You still look like you've produced something bad. Um, but then there's also the, you know, even aside from that, even if you write a convincing enough preface that says, no, no, the author really is ungrammatical and every time I do it, it's intentional. And even if that manages to convince people, you know, you still have to kind of ask yourself, is the badness working the same way? You know, um, I guess my general approach is, I'm assuming it's good. I'm assuming the badness is good and that the author did it for a reason, which is a positive reason. And so do I need to use other means towards that same ultimate end? Maybe, maybe a good analogy is the problem of dialect, which is always incredibly difficult to deal with because dialects are so grounded in specific things that don't translate kind of by definition. So um, the uh, book I translated from Dutch by an author named Neskio. Neskio is very famous sort of a la Mark Twain for sweeping aside all the stuffy Victorian stuff and bringing like colloquial vigorous energy into his fiction writing. And he uses Amsterdamish dialect. And so what do you do when you're translating it? It just doesn't make sense to make them sound Scottish or Southern or Brooklyn or, you know, whatever. Um, 
that flags that there's a dialect difference, but it doesn't sort of communicate what the point of the difference is. And so in that case, my decision was ultimately to not try and do any kind of dialect or accent, but just to make it kind of vigorous and vivid and slangy or at least punchy in other ways, maybe using more contractions, for example. So that's a case that's kind of like mistakes where you sort of ask yourself, okay, what's the ultimate purpose or effect on the reader we're trying to get with these linguistic tics that are not going to be able to come across the same way. Um, you know, that's why translating rhymed poetry is so hard because practically everything in the poem is sort of uh, anchored to this specific phonic quality that you're not going to be able to kind of bring in a, in a normal way. But um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I hadn't ever quite thought about it before, but I hope that was that was interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Did I see that Raymond McKenzie had a question earlier? Um, you're muted now, though. There we ah, go. There, go. there we go. Yeah, uh, again, thank you for a wonderful talk. And I, I was especially struck by your stress on how a, uh, a book translated into English has to be an English book and exist alongside other English books. But that raises a kind of vexed question of the foreignizing translation versus the domesticating translation. Um, and there's a sense in which when we pick up the translated book, um, you know, we expect we are reading a book that comes from Germany or that comes from France. And there's there's a certain, I don't know, layer of foreignizing that that I've always thought ought to be there, ought to remind me that this isn't a book that came out of an English speaker, but from, from another, another person. The example you gave of uh, a loneliness rose up within me versus I felt lonely. Um, there's something rather rather grand and abstract in the previous in the first version that isn't in the second. Right. And there might be cases in which you uh, in which you want to keep that. Anyway, just a just a comment. Uh, oh, I totally agree. And um, in fact, that is another um, sort of tightrope or Cillin Charybdis or whatever your metaphor is of uh, translation, which is, uh, you know, the editor even asked me, is like, wow, it reads so smoothly now in your translation, is it too smooth? And there have been some sort of reviews, both in online forums or whatever, and also in print that have said about my Rilke, that they miss some of the poetic grandeur of earlier versions. Um, I mean, everyone just sort of places their bets and takes their chances. You know, everyone sort of stakes out what they think is the best line to, to walk. And what I ended up saying to the editor was sort of in for a penny, in for a pound, like, what I think my translation offers is like directness and vigor and clarity and that the poetry kind of comes that way. And it doesn't offer like the fog machines and the kind of light show and the sort of um, more bells and whistles sense of like, you're really reading poetry with the capital P now. So, um, you know, for better, or for worse. Some people like one, some people like the other. That's why they're different translations and different people will like different ones. But I did decide not to like fancy it up intentionally in order to try and, you know, reach that audience because I just felt like that was going against my main um, direction and sort of what I had to offer the world by translating it this way. Um, in terms of the foreignizing, domesticating thing, um, for anyone out there who doesn't know this, that is probably the uh, most influential and kind of central dichotomy that people who write about translation, do translation theory, do translation studies use. Domesticating uh, being the bad word, 
that means, um, you know, you erase cultural difference, you don't care about the uniqueness and you just make it palatable to um, a homegrown audience that doesn't know any better and foreignizing almost always being the good word that goes with respect and sensitivity and multiculturalism and, um, you know, acknowledging the nuances that exist in another culture that, you know, you're educating English readers towards as opposed to just erasing out of a misguided sense that English readers can't handle it. That's the sort of extreme polemic version of this dichotomy that, of course, it's also possible to describe in more measured ways. Um, and again, if you don't know what we're talking about, one example might be, you know, do you say that someone goes to the baker and gives them a certain number of marks or do you say dollars do you, or strings of coins? Um, do you call something goulash or do you call it like meat stew or whatever? That's an easy one because we know what goulash means, but if there's some, you know, to an imagined American reader weird food, do you explain that Eba is a cassava, you know, whatever, whatever, or do you just use the word? That's like a very obvious case of do you foreignize it or do you domesticate it? Um, the other reason that's easy is that those things tend to go with stuff like local color and American publishers want there to be some local color. So, you know, you're not going to have the Chinese peasant spending five dollars um, because it's going to be clear from context that whatever word you throw in there means money. But in the bigger picture, um, how much effort do you spend trying to um, you know, domesticate it, and how much do you sort of expect the reader to do more work? Now, I have very big problems with the whole dichotomy. Um, for one thing, foreignizing is never actually foreignizing because you're still doing it in English. If you have the like Nazi guards speaking with a German accent, they're still speaking English with a German accent. Or they're saying stuff like Achtung, which you expect an English reader to know. They're not actually speaking German. It's not foreign. It's a translation. No matter how off-putting or alienating or confusing you choose to make your English, you're not, in fact, making it Arabic. You're making it a certain kind of English that you then claim is an appropriate way to translate Arabic. So I think conceptually, I have a real problem with the whole distinction. Um, and I just don't think that that's what translation is. If I'm sitting at home and I'm reading a book in German, I'm not bringing anything anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just reading. And I happen to be someone who can read this book because I know German and some people can't. But it's not foreign or domestic. I'm sitting in my house reading a book that someone else wrote. And it can be just as world altering and eye opening and transporting as a book that some other person wrote in English. Or as, you know, formulaic, bland, and pointless as a book that someone wrote in English. It's, it's just a book. It's not foreign. It's not domestic. Those are not the right categories. And so when I'm translating, I don't think those are the right categories to think in. I can think in terms of being more pedagogical versus more popular, for example, in terms that's like the footnotes question, you know. I think that you do have to think about those issues. For example, how practically every novel translated into English from Arabic has to have a little glossary in the back of like, this is a food, this is a currency, and books translated from Spanish don't have that. So in a way, giving more information 
is more exoticizing and alienating than giving less information. You don't need a glossary for a Garcia Marquez novel because it's a novel. Whereas if it's a Mafuz novel, suddenly it's not a novel anymore. It's this alien text that you need help with. And so it's a double-edged sword, you know, who you're bringing closer or farther from whom. But I just don't think that the distinction between foreignizing and domesticating is right or is the helpful way to think about the issues. Um, am I right that David Luft had a question earlier? There are also two questions in the chat. I just wanted to yep, say. I've seen them. I'm just trying to go in order. Thank you. I, I mainly uh, wanted to uh, uh, say, say thank you for a terrific presentation, which I enjoyed a lot. I've, I've lost your face on the screen here. Oh, I'm still here, so you can talk. OK. <laughs> oh, there you are. Greetings. Uh, no, you did a great job. And uh, I found a, a lot of it helpful. And, I, my own questions were along the lines of things that have been already mentioned. I was particularly impressed with the, your point about dynamic nouns in German. I think it's a, the most constructive way I've ever heard that point made. And you also make clear that once you start doing it, there are a lot of decisions to make still about what to keep and what to throw away. I think the question in your approach is how much to give in to the German. Um, what to, how, how far to go to try to achieve the quality that the German has. And I, I've spent most of my time translating Musil and Hofmannsthal. And with Musil, I was doing essays and my big concern was trying to convey his ideas. But they were ideas that an American wouldn't have had and wouldn't have had in that way. Right. And then with Hofmannsthal, I found myself wanting to write the way Hofmannsthal would have written if he had lived in our culture. Mm -hmm. And yet to somehow make you feel as if you were living in his culture. Yeah, I, I think that in my mind, this question and the foreignizing, domesticating one are, are quite similar. Absolutely. In other words, you were just saying, like, how much do you keep the German, what the German's doing? Um, and maybe it's because I'm first and foremost a reader, not a professor, but I'm approaching it as a, as a reader. In other words, my answer to that question of, like, how much do you keep is, well, here I am. I'm someone who read these Museal essays and got something out of it and think that they're good and interesting. I'm not Austrian, but I got something out of them. And so my job is to make it possible for people who read only English versions of this to get out of them what I got out of them as a reader. So I don't ultimately have the sort of pedagogical purpose of instructing you how Musil was putting sentences together and where his ideas come from. I mean, maybe I do. Maybe I write an essay on Musil or maybe I write a long afterward or something like that. But in the translation, you know, I mean, that's true of this too. Like I wrote biographical afterward. I wrote a sort of conceptual introduction and, you know, I was um, aiming it at readers on that register of sort of nonfiction instruction separated from the translation. But um, in terms of like your example of Museal, I would say, well, you know, I read them as a reader, not necessarily as a scholar, and I got something out of them. So that's what I want to translate. There it is. And it's not really qualitatively different from the Hoffmannsthal situation. In this imagined you, version, I'm found not what's absolutely there. Say again. It's it's giving what you found when you read it. Well, I think that is the way you have to frame it because if you frame because first of all, it's true. I mean, there is no objectively there except for the readers. Um, 
And if you put it that way in terms of like a translation tries to capture what's really there, then you're automatically creating there's like the perfect translation that gets everything that's there and then there are better ones that get 80% and then there are really terrible ones that get 5%. And I just don't think that's how translation works um, any more than reading. You know, um, the there's no best reading of Hamlet that gets everything. It's, you you are, reading it and i am trying to convey what's there i mean it's a it's uh it's a perspective that has a lot to do with phenomenology you know the fact that i exist in a particular place as a body with certain senses you know directed in certain ways isn't actually a limitation it isn't a sort of falling off of some purported God's eye view of everything. It's actually how perception works. And so similarly with translation, you know, the fact that it's my reading doesn't make it less than complete. It makes it real. It makes it, you know, alive and engaged and the only thing there is anyway. So, yeah. Nice. I'd like to um, turn to the two questions in the chat and I'll read them both first. Um, and then Damien, I think you can look back at them if you'd like to. So the first, is from Jeff, the first is from Jeff Howes, um, who says, thank you for the stimulating talk. Did you ever find yourself referring ahead to Rilke's later poetry? <coughs> Excuse me, my, uh, in making lexical and stylistic choices. And the second question is from Allison Link, who asks, you may have already alluded to this a bit, but can you describe a bit more your process of developing empathy for an author and their voice as you're working on a translation? Are there some empathy building strategies you tend to use as you're starting work on a translation? Wow, great question. Um, they both are, especially the second one I find very striking. Uh, the first one, did I ever find myself referring ahead to Roka's later poetry? Um, it's interesting. Um, I hadn't asked myself that exactly. I think not so much in the case of Letters to a Young Poet. However, in translating Rilke's poetry, there is this intertextual um, approach of referring to other texts and um, in a way, this goes with the point I made before about how editorial decisions are the same, or at least in the same bag as, as translation decisions. I have earlier done a, a, a translation of Rilke's creative stuff. This is called The Inner Sky, Poems, Notes, Dreams. And so it does have prose in there as well as poetry. Um, but this was also my... Um, edition, like I'm the one who brought these texts together. It turns out none of the texts in here were published uh, in books in Roka's lifetime, you know, so there's a lot of uncollected stuff. And there were certain sort of themes and, um, and ground tones that I saw throughout Roka's work that influenced what I decided to put in here and also how I translated it kind of together. So um, that's a case where, um, yes, as I'm translating some specific thing, I'm also thinking about what this word or what this idea means to him in light of his work in general. Um, even the inner sky, for example, is a translation of the word realm, which the dictionary would tell you means space and not sky. But I talk about in the afterward to this book that translating it as inner space, aside from making you think of Martin Short, um, also fails in certain ways to do what the word realm is doing in Rilke in that poem and throughout. And so um, it definitely is a sort of um, aspect of the decision making in general, although I don't think that much in letters to a young poet um, in particular. The second question uh, it is really is really fascinating um, because I agree that 
empathy for the author is behind a lot of this. And even in a lot of my answers, you know, I've been saying things in terms of, you know, what do I think they really want to do? Or what do I think they really care about? Or what's important to them or stuff like that. Um, I haven't really thought pointedly or consciously about empathy building strategies. I think that's kind of my default. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a gullible person, especially for things I read. And when I was in grad school, the like hermeneutics of trust versus hermeneutics of suspicion, I'm, I'm like a very hermeneutics of trust person. You know, when I read some philosopher, I'm like kind of always trying to get at what their, um, what they were aiming at, as opposed to sort of having my reflexive approach be to sort of read against the grain or look behind it or sort of debunk it or, or analyze it that way. So I guess I just, I mean, I guess I just think that that's my starting point in general for better and for worse. I mean, there certainly is a for worse, you know, in that the people who read against the grain get to a lot of super important stuff that I wouldn't necessarily get to until I read their essays not against the grain and I'm like oh you're right you're right to debunk this other person who before I read you I trusted them you know um but I I would say that uh because of that I've never really thought about like conscious empathy building strategies. I mean, I'm just always thinking as a translator, like, you know, what do they mean? Um, and I don't know if that's sort of too simple and obvious to count as an empathy building strategy, but, um, you know, even in the case of the like bad French art history example, I'm trying to be like, well, okay, your sentence says this, but is that is that what you're really trying to say or not? You know, and and um, I wonder if that is an empathy building strategy. Whoever asked it can feel free to jump in. But anyway, that that's what I can think of to say in answer to that question. It's it's, it's a fascinating question. I wonder if I need more strategies or if I need more, you know, anti-empathy building strategies in order to kind of see both sides of things. And so the questioner says, agreed, it seems like you've got some interestingly intuitive approach as a reader that influences your translation approach. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I think. Um, Well, Damien, um, I want to thank you again, both for a really, really wonderful talk and a fantastic discussion. Um, this is great. And I want to thank all of you for being here with us this evening. Yes, thank you for the great questions. And for anyone who didn't ask any, thank you for listening and being here. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>